uh, really did the, the hard work I'm here just to introduce and, and trying to say what is the goal of this conference. So uh, why we're here is very uh, obvious. Uh, healthcare is a sector that is not incredibly economically important, uh, is also politically and socially important, and is a sector with a lot of problems. Uh, my colleague uh, Tom has shown, for example, how in the dialysis, we let people uh, die because uh, is the market is too concentrated. So if there is a place where uh, we need to study and to have uh, impact, I think that this is clearly the one. Now, what is interesting is that uh, uh, in this sector, there are a lot of brilliant uh, uh, economists and academic uh, uh, working on this. Uh, what is interesting is uh, how segmented from the rest of economics is. And it says no generally educated economist will feel confident in not knowing any macro or any label or any finance. I think most uh, educated economists, and I am a first guilt uh, in charge, don't know anything about healthcare. Okay, and, uh, and so really what uh, uh, the goal here is to reduce the barrier to entry in this sector so that more people study this sector because it's so important and because uh, it's so, uh, uh, if I may say with Fiona, screwed up. Um, now, uh, who? Uh, so I simply acted as a, a catalyst and the, the Stigler Center who is dedicated to study uh, the role that vested interests have in uh, limited competition, I think was the, the natural uh, audience or natural, uh, um, I think, uh, um, envelope to uh, host this uh, initiative because uh, uh, of the obvious concentration and uh, competition issues that are here. Now, uh, as I said, uh, all the work of uh, coordinating organizing, then uh, at, at the end of the conference, we're going to thank also the logistic part, but on the uh, design of the paper, choice of the author, and, and following up, I think all the work has been done by Fiona Scott Morton, uh, by Craig uh, Garthwaite, and uh, uh, later joined also Matt Notto, who is running uh, in, uh, in the, the healthcare initiative at Booth and is co sponsoring also. Uh, this uh, initiative. So um, this is uh, uh, this brilliant mind thought that the, the best way to get us started was not to have a big public conference. Uh, the Stigler Center has done in the past conference on concentration, bringing also uh, the media, the broader world to have a conversation with the broader world. I think eventually we're going to do that, uh, I, not only for uh, pandemic e reasons, but also for strategic reasons, we, we thought the first uh, meeting should be a, only among economists to really uh, uh, educate the one of us, like me, who need education, and to cross-fertilize the one of you who are really uh, very knowledgeable in one sector, but maybe uh, not uh, enough in others. And so um, this is uh, the, the way the conference is organized is that the authors have produced a paper that summarize why their topic is important and uh, what is the current level of economic knowledge in the field, uh, outline the key pending research questions, and outline what we need to overcome to answer these questions. And so the goal here is really to uh, prompt uh, much more collaboration and work in this area because uh, we need it. We need it. Uh, not only from an intellectual point of view, we need from a social point of view. So I think that uh, the uh, success of this conference is going to be measured in how many uh, papers will be spun off from it. Thank you. All right, so thank you very much, everyone who came in person. Uh, I agree, everyone online is going to miss out on part of this, but uh, there are trade offs in life. Um, Luigi, uh, so sped, uh, I think, covered everything we're trying to do here very well. Um, so I think one, one thing I would think we would be remiss in saying, I want to say thank you to all the Stigler staff, but in particular to Filippo, um, who I think, like, if there's, if there's something harder than herding cats, I think that's what he had to do to get Fiona and I to sort of. Uh, jointly concentrate on this uh, and then bringing Matt in, I think, is uh, actually gets him to do some work uh, to put this together. Um, 
healthcare, as you said, it's, you know, it's, it's a big part of the economy. I think it's sort of weird in a room like this to have to say that, but it's 20% of the US economy. When I give talks on this, I like the sort of norm said that, that makes it roughly the economy of Germany. So we start talking about sort of the size of what we're saying. Um, there's often a conversation, I think, in the US, and people in this room will make this comment, I think Fiona as well, that we spend too much on healthcare. Um, I don't know if that's actually true or not, right? I think we have lots of money in the United States. We're a really rich country. We could spend 20%. I think mean, the real question is a sense of like, are we efficiently spending that money? Are we getting value for what we want? If there's something that we have sort of, anyone who's dealt with the US health system or read papers in this, it seems we're not fully getting all the value we might want. There's a ton of inefficiencies. And economists, I think, have a unique way of trying to understand and document what those inefficiencies are. And to Luigi's point to date, that really has been done by a set of people who primarily concentrate on healthcare. I think a reason for that is that there are meaningful barriers to entry that Luigi was talking about. A lot of this, a lot of this is about institutions, right? With the US healthcare, understanding institutions in many ways leads to the inefficiencies that we have here. Um, and even we start talking about the idea of healthcare, healthcare itself is a pretty broad sector. We've got payers and providers, and we've got you know, uh, products in terms of pharma and devices. Those have two different business models, two different ways of generating revenue, different ways of paying for it. Um, and so even then you have to dig in and say, as a sec the first paper will talk about generics, the second paper will talk about pharmacy benefit managers. Right? There's a ton of nuance there. Um, but just cause like I know a lot about institutions um, I don't know a lot about what I should say. That. I know a decent amount about economics. If I said a lot about economics, and Ben would probably <laughs> agree with that. Um, but part of what we want here maybe is also in terms of the, we'll judge it by the papers that are coming out, it's sort of the partnerships that are coming out as well. That a lot of what we want to do is bring in people's knowledge from outside of healthcare. And I always think of Tom as being a really nice example of that, where I don't think of you as a health economist, but the work you're doing here is helping us understand the economics of these markets. And so in addition to sort of judging this as the papers that come out of this, I would hope that we're able to bring in as a result of this broad effort, people who might not traditionally be in healthcare. My colleague, Mike Powell, I think a nice example of that as well. Um, uh, organizational economists, I think organizational economics in particular is something that we need to bring into healthcare because um, we don't think about that. We talk about an organization and then just stop thinking what goes on inside that black box. Um, so we wanna have people do that. The papers are meant to give therefore an overview of that. Right? This, is, this is sort of areas where we think there needs to be more work and we're never gonna make progress unless we get the rest of our smarter and better economists outside of healthcare to think about these issues. And that's sort of the other goal I think is to bring just more people as opposed to just more papers into that. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to the first panel as you think about sort of generic competition as a solution. Thanks, Craig. <clears throat> I just want to amend Luigi's remark that people are not comfortable going through life knowing no macro, for example. It's definitely, <laughs> definitely not true in my case. Okay. <laughs> All right, it's great to uh, see so many uh, good friends here. And I wanna um, thank uh, Filippo in particular, but everybody at the Sigler Center for helping to put this together and for all of you who wrote papers uh, for stepping up because these are papers that are not uh, designed to advance your career. They're designed to, as, uh, as Craig said, bring more people into the field and try to actually make progress uh, in solving vexing social problems. So it's, it's a really good effort. Um, I've generic competition paper with Nitsan Arad and Robin Feldman who are both online and uh, we'll turn to them for brief parts of the presentation as we go. But meanwhile, Nick, oh, I forgot. I was told bring the clicker and Sebastian told me and I forgot, sorry. Maybe I should get my other clicker. It disappeared, okay. Oh, there, now it works, okay. Um, the paper uh, also, as Craig said, the research questions are an important output of this conference and those are in our paper. I'll try to highlight some as I go, but mostly this presentation doesn't really focus on the research questions, which is maybe an error. Um, so th they're there, uh, however, in the paper. Okay, uh, the fundamental trade-off here, as you all know, in drugs is that market exclusivity allows for financial returns and that stimulates innovation that helps consumers, but market exclusivity also allows high prices and that harms consumers, that, that cost of paying for them harms consumers. So we have government granted patents that are of limited duration and the market exclusivity for certain investments like trials and children to balance these conflicting goals. And then at the end of the patent exclusivity period, generic entry 
occurs and society uh, gets to have the drug at marginal cost. The problem is that regulators in Congress, encouraged by incumbents, have created entry barriers for bio, uh, generic and biosimilar drug products. I'm going to lump those together when I say generics uh, is the answer to drug costs. Um, and incumbents have created entry barriers and excluded uh, generic and biosimilar drug makers. And regulators and antitrust enforcers and so on have failed to uh, uh, counter or get rid of those tactics. Regulators in Congress have further constructed markets and the way they do procurement so that brands that should be competing with each other are not. And the result is we have less competition from generics, less competition among brands and higher costs for everybody. So our solutions, I'm gonna put forward a bold statement that our solutions involve no or little trade-off and let everybody complain about that if you disagree. But I would say that today the balance between innovation and access is undermined because we have let the firms convince the government to uh, basically delay or, or inhibit uh, generic entry and generic competition. And this inappropriately redistributes surplus from consumers to corporations and returning to balance on this dimension would lower costs. And it may reduce innovation, but the innovation it's gonna reduce is innovation that A, Congress decided already was not worth having because that's why they made the patent the fixed length. And B, for a product that couldn't survive in a competitive market anyway because it's duplicative and or higher cost than something else that works just as well. Okay, so we don't really have a trade-off here, I think. Um, the paper does not cover the problem of pricing a breakthrough treatment. Okay, so this is about all stuff that has substitutes. It's, uh, I, in my view, it's worth paying a high price for a cure for a valuable unmet need. Uh, unfortunately, those are rare. Uh, and when people complain about this, I say at such times the pharmaceutical industry gets good enough to deliver us a bunch of those treatments, economists will work on that problem. But meanwhile, what we're doing is paying very high prices for very boring duplicative drugs, and that just makes uh, no sense and is very costly. So uh, what I'm going to do now is turn the discussion over to Robin for five minutes or so, and then Nitsan for a few minutes, and then I'll come back and, and do a bit uh, at the end. So Robin, um, if you're there and the people in charge can unmute you, please take it away. Thank you. I hope I'm unmuted. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fiona, for, for inviting me to this. I'd like to say at the outset that I think part of the barrier to entry for young economists in this area is patents itself because they are, they are fairly complicated and they seem intimidating. So um, um, I'd like to say they're, they're not. And if you know young people in the field who want to dip their toe into this and, and uh, would like a tour or some help along the way, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions as a patent law professor. All right. So as Fiona pointed out, in theory, a US patent should last for 20 years after which lower price versions should enter and drive prices down, but that's not what's happening. Instead, drug companies have become adept at creating walls of protection around their drugs. So how does one protect a wall? How does one build a wall? Well, first companies pile on large number of patents by making minor modifications to a drug's formulation or its dosage or its delivery system or by patenting different aspects of the drug, such as different ways you can use it or different ways you can manufacture it. Many of these secondary patents are of questionable validity. In patent law terms, they, are, they should be obvious. And when generic companies fully litigate secondary patents, they win three quarters of the time. But the more patents you have, particularly with biologics, the more expensive it can be to challenge them. In addition to patents, companies can obtain more than a dozen non-patent exclusivities from the FDA. Uh, these include the orphan drug exclusivity, which provides an additional seven years of protection. Orphan drug protection was aimed at drugs for which the company could not expect to recoup the cost of its research, but orphan drug exclusivity is now associated with very big dollar returns. In 2015, for example, of the 10 drugs with the highest sales revenue, seven were associated with orphan drug exclusivities. Now the practice of piling on new patents and exclusivities is known as evergreening, given that it can refresh the company's protection on the drug. And in fact, 78% of the non-biologic drugs associated with the new patents are existing drugs. They're not new drugs coming on the market. That's what Fiona was referring to earlier. So we're seeing a lot of churn. 
In addition to making it difficult for generics and biosimilars to overturn piles of patents, patent laws hamper generic competition in other ways. The generic business model relies on pharmacists substituting the generic. Pharmacists are only allowed to make the substitution if the generic is exactly the same in dosage, in delivery system, in everything. So once the brand name company creates a new version of the drug, say a tablet rather than a capsule, the company then shifts the market to the new version using techniques such as extensive advertising, even if there's no evidence of a clinical benefit for patients, or removing the old drug from the market, which is a handy technique that keeps the generic from gaining approval because it can't show the FDA that it's equivalent to the old branded drug if there's no old branded drug around. The brand company can also shift the market by striking deals with health plans and their PBM intermediaries to favor the new drug in the plan's reimbursement tours. So shifting the market in these ways is known as product hopping. The market for biologic drugs presents particular challenges for competitions. With non-biologic drugs, the brand company must publicly list the patents and exclusivities it claims against the drug. That's not so with biologics. So biologic companies are left guessing. Moreover, pharmacists are not allowed to automatically substitute a biosimilar for a biologic. They can only do that with something called interchangeables. And so far we've only had one interchangeable and it's being blocked by other games. Naming differences have further hampered the uptake of biosimilars. Finally, much of the critical information for biologic drugs is held as trade secrets. With patents, at least some of the information is publicly released, but trade secrets are, well, secrets. Other techniques that brand companies use to reduce competition include so-called pay-for-delay agreements. With pay-for-delay, brand companies provide some form of value to a generic that has filed for approval at the FDA, and the generic stays off the market for a period of time. Now, the Supreme Court opened the door to antitrust scrutiny of pay-for-delay in 2013. However, these agreements have become extremely complex and courts have struggled to unpack them, as well as struggling with what is meant by each of the terms pay, for, and delay. Now, our, our piece lists other strategies used to impede competition, and these include abuse of the process for developing safety protocols at the FDA, these are called REMS, by using this as an excuse not to cooperate with generics applying for approval. We also discuss abuse of the citizen petition process at the FDA. Rather than hearing from citizens, the FDA is flooded with petitions from drug companies. So in some years, one in five citizen petitions filed at the FDA, and this includes all petitions involving tobacco and food and dietary supplements. One in five is from a pharmaceutical company seeking to block entry of a competing drug. Now, up to 90% of those petitions are eventually denied, but they do delay generic entry. So on that cheerful tour, I'll hand it off to our co-author, Nitsan Arad. Hi hey everyone, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Just a quick caveat, I am not an economist, but I will do my best to cover these points from the policy perspective. Um, if we could please go over to the next slide. Um, so um, covering some of the challenges that are created by the FDA, Robin touched on some of them and I'll um, describe them in a bit more detail. Um, this is specifically for biosimilars. So biosimilars, as we know, hold a lot of promise in creating substantial healthcare savings given the high costs of originary biologics and their growing use in the system. Even if the common view has generally been that they can't compete with the originators to the same degree that we see in the small molecule drug market, given the more significant barriers to entry for, for biosimilars. But the US started late when it came to biosimilars. It wasn't until 2010 under the Affordable Care Act that the pathway for the approval of biosimilars were, was created by Congress and until 2015 that the first biosimilar was approved by the FDA, years after the creation of the biosimilar pathway in Europe and the EMA's approval of the first biosimilars. The US is still lagging behind Europe in the number of biosimilar approval and launches. One of the key elements in, in facilitating more biosimilar competition in the US is the extent to which the FDA can determine biosimilarity in the most efficient way without compromising safety and efficacy. 
And regulatory experts have generally been arguing that based on the emerging evidence, the comparative efficacy studies that the FDA usually requires for biosimilar approval may be unnecessary in the development of most biosimilars as they provide very little scientific value. Um, this is something that was recently echoed by the UK drug regulator. Another potential opportunity and barrier in the US um, is interchangeability, which Robin briefly described. So when the US biosimilar pathway was created, Congress established a second designation in addition to biosimilarity called interchangeability, which generally requires additional costly clinical studies. And if a sponsor achieves interchangeability, then the biosimilar could be substituted for the reference product in the retail pharmacy setting, depending on state law. This could be very important because it might facilitate fast market share growth for lower priced biosimilars, somewhat similar to generics. Um, there are two biosimilars that have received this designation so far, both very recently. The first is an insulin, which is one of the simplest biologics, um, and a biosimilar version of Humira, which is a more complex monoclonal antibody, and therefore this is more important from the regulatory and scientific standpoint. Now there's a question of uptake. For the interchangeable insulin, one of the largest PBMs in the country just announced that it would give it preferential formulary treatment, which is encouraging. The Humira biosimilar, on the other hand, will not launch until 2023 because of IP barriers. So, and we'll need to wait and see how Perriers will respond to this one and if it succeeds in capturing significant market shares from the originators. There are some lingering questions about uptake given the state laws that govern interchangeable biosimilar substitution tend to be more restrictive than the ones governing small molecule generics. And there are some concerns related to the life cycle management strategy of AbbVie, the originator manufacturer, um, that has shifted a lot of the market to a newer version, similar to what Robin was describing earlier, which could impede the uptake of this interchangeable biosimilar. And, but in addition to the promise that interchangeability holds, it also raises some questions and difficulties. So the FDA already ensures that any approved biosimilar is clinically equivalent to the reference product with no clinically meaningful differences. But still Congress instructed the FDA to create another process for demonstrating that patients can switch, switch safely and effectively between a biosimilar and the reference product. And that has led to some misperceptions of safety issues of biosimilars that do not have this designation. And with only two interchangeables in the market in over 10 years since the enactment of the biosimilar pathway, there is a question on whether interchangeability with, it, with its existing requirements is really contributing to the uptake of biosimilars in the market, or if there's room to revisit it in some way, legislatively or regulatorily by making the bar more flexible. The unique suffix requirements for biosimilars, which don't apply to existing originators, are potentially another source of misperception and confusion about the true equivalence of biosimilars to their reference products, especially since this requirement also applies to interchangeable biosimilars. So under the current paradigm, two products have different non-proprietary names, even if they're interchangeable by the FDA. Um, can we please switch to the next slide? Um, so switching gears to exclusionary contracting practices that the originator manufacturer uses to limit the entry of biosimilars. Drug rebates um, that typically have a pro-competitive purpose are sometimes paired with the loyalty element, meaning that the originator leverages its dominant position in the market and removes rebates to payers unless the biosimilar is effectively excluded from that payer's market, or at the very least receives a non-preferred formula replacement. So the payer has to meet a certain market share threshold, for example, 95%, or it will have to pay higher costs for the originator if it buys more than 5% from the biosimilar competitor. This occurs even when the biosimilar enters with the lower per unit price than the reference biologic. So it's really only when the payer uses the biosimilar exclusively or almost exclusively that the savings from the biosimilar can be enough to overcome this trap. But if the payer can't entirely stop purchasing from the originator and switch to the biosimilar, it would pay more for the originator and for some biosimilar utilization than for the rebated um, originator alone. And there are different factors in the healthcare system that have made these large scale switches difficult to achieve. Some of them are structural, for example, the lack of automatic substitution for non-interchangeable biosimilars, 
which doesn't enable its fast and automatic market growth as in the case of generics. And some are perceived like providers hesitancy to switch patients mid-treatment when the patient is already stabilized on the existing originator. And that's the basic rebate wall scenario. There, these rebate walls can even be more prohibitive. For example, when the originator biologic is approved for additional indications beyond the indications of the biosimilar, for example, because of patent or regulatory protections, and then a lower net price for the biosimilar will not be sufficient to overcome the loss of rebates from the larger prescription volume of the originator. Another scenario, um, which was litigated in courts is when the originator bundles additional products in its rebate agreement with the payer, which may be the most challenging for the biosimilar to overcome when it doesn't have a comparable portfolio. I'll turn this back over back to Fiona. Um, so uh, I'll just finish up with a, a few other uh, remarks. So we have again, on small molecules, we also see loyalty rebates. On small molecules, as Robin explained, we also see product hopping. Um, and the product hopping, let me just say, or evergreening, uh, requires some help, usually, I think, from the PBM. That is to say, if the new entrant comes in, everybody switches, the old generic is pulled out, so you have to switch. When the, sorry, the old product is pulled out, so patients have to switch to the new product, the evergreen product. When a generic eventually does enter the old product, if you belong to the L Health Plan, you're switched back in about one minute to the, to the generic from the uh, entering brand. But a PBM might not have the incentive to switch everybody back to the generic because the brand is gonna offer them a share of the rents. And if the brand share of the rents induces the PBM to help the brand keep everybody on the new evergreen product, then that might outweigh the desire of the customer, the end customer for lower expenditures, lower costs, lower prices overall. And so it depends how good an agent the PBM is for the end customer. Are they caring about their customer? Are they able to hide that and uh, go after the profits? Uh, my clicker is no longer working. Thanks. Um, so the PBM as an intermediary, we're gonna hear about this in the next section, but I think that's it's really important that we understand that the incentive as for an intermediary that can sponsor entry, uh, the intermediary has an incentive to share the rents from the monopoly power instead of sponsoring entry. So we need some more competition among PBMs and transparency. Uh, and then we have incumbents end or soften price competition by doing an end run around the, P the financial incentives created by the PBMs through something called couponing or basically financial aid for patients who uh, need to buy an expensive drug. So an incumbent will donate to a foundation. The foundation buys its own drug. You have a 30% copay on that drug. The foundation asks for your tax return and then pays your 30% copay. And then whatever, finet or a coupon that you swipe at CVS and whatever the PBM's financial incentives were to get you to buy their preferred drug don't work anymore. And in equilibrium prices are gonna be higher if the PBM can't steer demand. So that's a big problem. Then we have Congress and Medicare softening price competition. For example, my favorite is the J code reimbursements. So we had a bad scheme to begin with, okay, where there was one J code given to paid to physicians who uh, inject you in their office for the innovator biologic and a different J code for all the biosimilars. Okay, so that meant that they didn't have to price compete because they were two different prices. Yes. A J code is the payment. A J code is the payment that Medicare gives the doctor that covers the cost of the drug that the doctor administers to you in his or her office. So you go in and you get injected with some expensive biologic that costs $5,000. How much does Medicare pay the doctor? Well, they pay them $5,000. It depends that that J code establishes its last quarter's average price in some, okay, somebody figures it out. But the point is there's one number for the brand and a different number for generics, which actually we don't do in the small molecule context at all. Then that was seen as a problem, so we reformed it, but the reform just made things worse because now there's a J code for every single manufacturer of the molecule. So the biosimilars don't have to compete with each other either because the doctor just gets paid whatever the doctor's costs are and so doesn't care which, uh, which drug they're using. So we, the taxpayers, don't get any advantage of competition between these molecules because the entity choosing which one to inject into you 
has no financial incentive to choose the cheaper one. So we clearly want one J code for all versions of the molecule. Congress also designed protected classes in Part D, which are a small mo molecule drug that says every one of those has to be covered. So that means that PBMs can't work to exclude those drugs. Congress legislated 12 years of exclusivity for biologics. So Congress is a problem too. Everything's a problem. All right. So conclude, in conclusion, enabling competition from generics and biosimilars, I think, is a low-cost way to reduce pharmaceutical expenditure with quite minimal impact on innovation. It's consistent with society's planned and stated trade-off. It would raise access, expand output, return surplus to consumers. It lowers prices most where you have the least amount of differentiation, generics and, and biosimilars. Uh, it protects the returns on innovative and valuable products. Okay, and then we might actually, I think, uh, get more uh, investment in products that are actually unique and different and valuable because those would not be subject to uh, so much competition and therefore would have higher returns. Um, okay, so I think we need a new bargain. Uh, in our view, it's important for society to be, continue to be willing to pay prices that are high for valuable innovative products, incremental quality adjusted life years. That might be a big number. This is not an inconsequential promise, but the quid pro quo for that promise is that we stop paying high prices for ordinary Me Too products and that we go with qualities for them too, and those are going to be low. The Adjuhelm argument, which is something like just pay us high prices because that creates a lot of money sloshing around in the pharmaceutical industry and eventually some innovation will result from that, okay? That to me is economically unsupported, it's costly, and it's imprecise relative to other policies. And if we would confine the high returns in pharma to actual innovative products, we might see investments in those innovative products instead of Me Too products. So that's, that's I think, uh, the, the bargain that we see. There's a lot of work that needs to be done documenting the harms uh, from all of this lack of competition and also uh, developing new schemes that could make competition work better and make entry uh, and work better, lower entry barriers. So those are, uh, again, in the paper. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's that's the Alzheimer's drug that swells your head and doesn't cure you and costs $5,000 a year and requires lots of scans. So it's like a negative productivity innovation. $56,000 doesn't cure you and makes your head swell. Okay. I probably spelled it wrong. <laughs> 